this contract's hypothetical is enormously difficult, and issues presented in this question are strikingly similar to ones that occur both on the multi-state and on essays all the way across the United States. Take a look with me at the call of the question. What are Delta's rights and liabilities, if any? Discuss. Well, the fact that the party's name is Delta implies that there's going to be some other party named Paul or some other variation of plaintiff, and we're going to have a case where these parties will have claims against one another. It's easy to glance just one little paragraph up and see the real call of the question. Pratt claims that Delta has breached their contract. Pratt refuses to pay Delta any sum of money and plans to sue Delta to recover $2,500, which was to be the retail price of the fish that were discarded. All right, well, that gives us a little bit more to work with. Delta is a contract's defendant. They are likely to have claims against the plaintiff as well. And so we go to the top of the question, reasonably aware of what we're looking for. In paragraph one, we meet Delta. They install equipment in stores, and we've got Pratt that operates a market. And we see their negotiations in page one. And we see from the very first paragraph the fact that Pratt wanted this work complete in advance of the July 4 holiday. So the purpose of the contract from the perspective of Pratt is clear, and Delta is on notice of their concern from the very first paragraph. In paragraph two, we see that Delta and Pratt meet, and Pratt signs a form called an authorization agreement. And we see that signature is made on the 31st of May. Here, the dates are important. Look at the quoted language. In the quoted language, we see that the installation is due within 30 days of the making of the contract. So this is a very difficult question about when this contract was formed. We see that Delta signs the agreement on the 4th of June. So 30 days from the 4th of June carries us all the way into the 4th of July holiday. Now, the underlying purpose of this agreement was to have this store ready for an opening at the beginning of the July 4 weekend. So the issue presented here is when is performance due? Was the contract actually entered into on the 31st when the parties actually agreed and Pratt signed? Or was the contract not really entered into until Delta signed on the 4th of June? And we see that Delta delayed signing in order to make sure that the parts were available for the installation job. So we understand the relationship between these parties reasonably well. But the question is still presented, when was this contract formed? It seems to me that the better answer would be to judge that the contract was formed on the 31st and that the other party, Delta, would have had the right to back out of the agreement if they had been unable to find the parts. But since they did have the parts, they thought they had the parts at least, I would say that their signature would bind them to an agreement that they actually had entered into earlier. Now, I will point out to you that that's just my opinion. A very persuasive argument can be written that reaches the opposite conclusion, indicating that the parties really hadn't agreed until Delta signed, in which case their performance would be due at or after the July 4 weekend. Now, we see in the next long paragraph the performance of the parties, and we see that only five of the six coolers were installed by June 28, and it turns out that Delta doesn't have all the parts it needs after all. So now Delta has to special order a part. That part doesn't show up until July 2nd, and then Pratt won't let them complete the job. So at this point, we've got, at least from Delta's perspective, a breach by Pratt, because from Delta's perspective, their performance is still timely, Pratt's refusal to let them complete the job and his refusal to pay for the work is a total breach of contract by Pratt. And again, a fairly persuasive answer can be written that is absolutely sympathetic to Delta and that finds Pratt wholly at fault. Now, it seems to me that an objective analysis of this question shows that both parties actually have pretty good arguments. And so there's plenty of room on an essay for someone to write a persuasive answer that reaches either conclusion. 
on the multi-state, we could see a pattern like this being used to focus our attention very closely on the dates that performance uh, is due and the, dates that the, the date that the contract was actually entered into. And we could imagine the examiners writing answers where the very best pick could be the one that supports either one of the outcomes. So I say this is quite a well-constructed question. Next, we've got the last long paragraph. We've got the plaintiff, Pratt, suffering from an opening of his restaurant that he considers to be a failure. And we also see that we've got a plaintiff discarding a bunch of fish. We know what the wholesale cost of that fish was to Pratt, and we also know what the retail value of that fish is because that's the price that he is suing for. So finally, we get the last paragraph before the formal call. We looked at this paragraph initially, and we see exactly what the parties are seeking. Pratt is suing Delta for breach of contract, and Pratt is seeking to recover the retail price of all of the fish that Pratt had to, felt he had to discard. And clearly, Delta is seeking payment under the agreement, either pursuant to the contract or alternatively under quasi-contract to prevent the unjust enrichment of Pratt. So now, turn the page for a moment, consider the outline of issues that I've presented. And before we look at the outline, again, let's pause for a moment and acknowledge just how difficult a question this is. This is a question that doesn't have a clear-cut correct answer. Many questions do, and it seems to me that a subtle and nuanced answer to this question will acknowledge the strength of both sides, but ultimately pick a winner and make sure that the analysis that reaches that conclusion supports the result that you ultimately reach. So, our basic framework of analysis will be pretty standard. We'll talk about the contract's formation, we'll talk about performance and breach, and then we'll talk about remedies. And here, fortunately, we at least have a pretty clear idea of what each party wants. And we also can fall back on what the party's theories of liability are. As we examine contract formation, we see that offer, acceptance, and consideration are all easy. They are present. The problem here is not really so much with regard to contract formation, but rather with regard to contract interpretation. We've got a plain document here. How do we analyze that document? We've got a vague term here with regard to the completion date. Now, looking at the four corners of the contract, if we find that the agreement was entered into on the 4th of June, when Delta signed the agreement, well, everything else follows from that. The date for performance being due becomes later than Pratt initially had wanted, and Delta's got time to complete, and therefore Delta basically wins across the board. But it seems to me that in order to interpret this contract, parole evidence is really necessary. And although the contract appears unambiguous on its face, the truth is that the defendant, Delta, was absolutely on notice as to plaintiff's needs under this contract. The face of the contract itself, I contend, is ambiguous because we know what the real desire of Pratt was. I would allow parole evidence in to interpret this agreement, and the result would be bad news for Pratt. Actually, yeah, it, it would be bad news for Delta in the long run, because I find that the contract was really agreed upon on the 31st of May. The parole evidence comes in to interpret the agreement in a way that ultimately is favorable to Pratt. Pratt's theory of liability is based on breach of contract. Delta's defense to that theory is the parole evidence rule forbids interpreting the contract beyond the four corners of the document. I allow parole evidence to come in, so my conclusion is the contract was entered into on the 31st. Delta could have escaped liability by backing out after finding that it couldn't get the parts. But once it signed on the 4th, it was merely ratifying the agreement it really had reached earlier. The date of performance, by my reasoning, is at the end of May. Therefore, Delta is in breach. Now, we consider performance in breach, and here... Because of the analysis that I present with regard to how this contract ought to be interpreted, Delta ends up being materially in breach of this agreement because of their failure to complete performance before the opening of this store. But we also see that the plaintiff is in breach of contract because he refused to allow the defendant a chance to cure, a chance to finish the job. 
And so now we have a situation where the plaintiff's refusal to pay a dime for this work arguably puts him in breach of contract. And even if he isn't in breach of contract, he is seeking to be unjustly enriched at the expense of Delta because he wants to keep these five coolers that already have been installed and he doesn't want to pay for them. And as we look at the facts, we see that the last cooler basically is in place, but it isn't connected yet. Well, that's not very serious work in terms of the cost to complete. So it seems to me that ultimately we can conclude that both parties are in breach, although Delta's breach is perhaps the more severe. So we turn to remedies and we see that what Delta is seeking under the agreement is restitution. Either full damage is under the agreement, and if you agree with Delta that the contract wasn't formed until Delta signed, then Delta is entitled to both payment under the contract and a reasonable time to complete performance. Because from the perspective of Delta, the reason they didn't finish timely is because of Pratt's breach, not because they didn't get the part installed before the 4th of July holiday began. Now what Pratt wants is damages for the full market value of this fish that he discarded. Well, I've got a couple of problems with that. First, there's no proof offered that he would have been able to sell all of this fish even if the store had opened exactly the way that he had wished. Next, we know that all plaintiffs have a duty to mitigate damages. And this guy throws out a bunch of fish that he could have put in the other coolers for a night or two or could have farmed out to some other cooling facility. I think it's unreasonable for Pratt to discard all of this fish and then ask Delta to pay for all of it. I don't think those losses are foreseeable to Delta, and I don't think Pratt can prove that he would have sold every last piece of this fish in the first place. So ultimately, my conclusion in this question is not favorable to Delta. I find Delta to be in breach, and I find that they are going to be liable to Pratt, at least to some extent, for damages. Now, we don't have enough facts to find out the extent to which Pratt has truly been damaged. But we can say this, Delta should have completed performance on time, and their failure to do so is going to find them to be in material breach of contract. So what are they entitled to? I would say that the appropriate way to find out what Pratt's liability would be would be to calculate how he has been enriched by the partial performance or even the substantial performance of Delta. I would allow Delta to recover in restitution, but Pratt is going to be a successful plaintiff in my court because I think Delta failed to complete when performance was due. Well, that wraps up a consideration of a complicated, difficult contracts question, one in which the people who wrote the question did an artful job of creating a pattern in which both sides have got strong arguments. And so we, the reader and bar candidate, have to come up with an answer that makes sense, is well organized, complete, and rational. You've got to find a home for the facts and reach a conclusion that is reasonably supported by the arguments that you've presented.